Well, we're back looking at how to measure relationships using correlation. I was r rudely cut off by the screencast uh, recorder uh, at the end of our 15 minutes on the previous screencast, but where we were was right here, so it's okay, we're, we're still good to go. We were simply looking at how we were measuring the covariance, uh, specifically the cross product deviation, using this set of imaginary data um, and we were visualizing deviation from the mean. That's where we were. Well, it's a fairly straightforward process then. If you were to calculate this by hand, you'd simply fill in the numbers into these formulas. Um, using SPSS, it will do it for you. Uh, the, the text by Andy Field walks through that, I think, very nicely for how to conduct a correlation analysis using SPSS. But let's just say that we're going to uh, walk through our uh, covariance calculation. So we're simply looking at the sum of individual scores minus the mean for X and the sum of individual scores minus the mean for Y. The first one is the difference from the mean for X and the difference from the mean for Y. Negative 3 and negative 6. And if we look over here, and I take all the marking off so you can see it a little more easily, the first one negative 3 and negative 6. The difference from the score to the mean for x is negative 3, for y is negative 6. And lo and behold, negative 3 times negative 6. If we move on to the next one in the series, we'll see that it's the x minus the mean is negative 2 and the y minus the mean is negative 4. And here we go back here, negative 2, negative 4. Right? So we're simply walking through each of these correlations between the X and the Y um, for each subject. And if we work through that, three, negative 3 times negative 6 is 18, negative 2 times negative 4 is 8, negative 1 times negative 2 is 2, 0 times 0 is 0, 1 times 2 is 2, 2 times 4 is 8, 3 times 6 is 18. Uh, n minus 1 is 7 minus 6 because we have 7 uh, uh, subjects and we're subtracting 1 for our degrees of freedom. So that gives us 6. Add that up, you get 56 divided by 6 for a covariance of 9.33. Now, the problem with covariance is that covariance depends upon the scales of measurement used. So, covariance is not a standardized measure. We cannot say whether a covariance for a data set is larger or smaller than another data set unless they were both measured in the same units. So if we wanted to compare the co covariance between two variables on the one hand and a different two variables on the other hand, it would be impossible to do because it all depends on the scales of measurement and it is not standardized, so it would all depend on whether or not they were measured using the same units. So what do we do? We can overcome that dependence on the measurement scale by converting covariance into a standard set of units, i.e. standardization. The standard deviation is a unit of measurement into which any scale of measurement can be converted, all we have to do is divide any distance from the mean by the standard deviation and it gives us that distance in standard deviation units. So the standardized covariance is known as a correlation coefficient and that is what we're going for. Because the covariance calculates two deviances and multiplies them, the standardized covariance also calculates two standard deviations, one for variable x, one for variable y, and multiplies them. That's simple. So this is the equation we end up with because we've just added this component. Now one of the more well-known correlation coefficients is the Pearson product moment correlation coefficient. Uh, this was developed created, invented, whatever you want to say, by Carl Pearson. Now here's a picture of Carl Pearson in 1934. So you'll see all these names for the different kinds of statistical tests. They really were created by real people. <laughs> um, 
this is a long time ago. Uh, we're not at 100 years yet, but we're closing in on it. So it's been a while, but in the scheme of things, that's relatively new. And the values of the correlation coefficient for Pearson lie between negative 1 and plus 1. Negative 1 being a perfectly negative relationship. That would look like this. And positive 1 being a perfectly positive relationship. That would look like this. And then the effect size is determined by the absolute value of the coefficient, meaning that how strong or how weak the correlation coefficient is, is the absolute value of the coefficient. So the absolute value of negative 1 and positive 1 is always going to be 1, right? It turns it into a positive number. So the closer you get to an absolute value of 1, the stronger the correlation coefficient. The closer you get then to zero, and if we think of this on a scale, there's zero, there's, here's the scale. There's negative one, there's zero, here's positive one. It's very strong on these ends, absolutely no relationship in the middle. So plus or minus 0.1, would be right here. Those are small effects. They're different than zero, but they're small effects. Plus or minus 0.3, it's about here and here. Those are medium effects. But plus or minus 0.5 or greater, so that'd be anything in this range, we're going to call those large effects. And before you conduct any correlational analysis, it is essential to plot a scatter plot to look at the general trend of the data. This will tell you whether or not the data is, well, it'll help you see if it's parametric, but it also it helps you to visualize the linearity of the data because we need linear data in order to do uh, this kind of a coefficient. So scatter plots tell us whether there seems to be a relationship between the variables what kind of relationship it is, and whether any cases are markedly different from the others. That's our outliers issue. So here's an example of our scatter plot of ads and packets. For subject one, the ads watched versus the uh, packets bought. For subject two, the ads watched, two ads watched, ten packet, packets bought. And you get how this goes, right? All right, so this is simply a scatter plot for ads to packets. There are all sorts of data that we can look at. This is just another one that I, I found on the internet, just to, to show you that we can plot all sorts of different things, whatever this local index is and the year. So the year we're plotting, and there are different years in here, right? We're plotting for this case or subject. The year is 1915. And the local index is like 52 or 54, something like that. Weight and horsepower, for some reason, is an example that's used a lot. So if you're an engineering person, or especially mechanical engineering, uh, or you have that kind of a background, you will, you will love this example. But the relationship between weight and horsepower of an engine is strong, linear, and positive but it's not perfect, and it's not perfect because it doesn't all line up on an exact line. Right? The Pearson correlation coefficient is positive 0.92. That is very large, large and in charge. Right? And the greater the horsepower, the heavier the engine. Drive ratio and horsepower is negatively related. And the Pearson correlation coefficient for this is negative 0.59. We're still going to say this is large, but it's not as large as horsepower and weight. And the relationship between drive ratio and miles per gallon is also positive, but you can see that the Pearson correlation coefficient is getting weaker. So we can still plot a line through here. But we're getting enough distribution, enough scattering here, that it's becoming difficult to say that we're really confident in this. And this is what a medium effect looks like, this kind of a, this kind of a scatter plot. <clears throat> Finally, the relationship between miles per gallon and engine displacement is strongly positive, but it's curvilinear. In other words, if you were to plot a linear line, it would do this. Okay. But the problem is that a linear line is inappropriate. 
What, what the real relationship is this curvilinear one. So a Pearson correlation coefficient is not appropriate to measure the level of association between miles per gallon and engine displacement. So why do we use correlation? Well, uh, we can use it for prediction. If two values have been known in the past to correlate, then we can assume they will continue to correlate in the future. We can use the value of one variable that is known now to predict the value that the other one will take on in the future. This is similar to regression. For example, why do we require high school students to take the SAT or ACT exam in the United States to get into college? Well, it's because we have known that students who scored well on the SAT or ACT exam tended to complete university or do well in university. It doesn't mean it's going to always be true, but there is an association between achievement or completion of university and high scores or higher scores on the SAT or ACT. We can also use correlation for validity to establish validity. Suppose we've developed a new test of intelligence. We can determine if it is really measuring intelligence by correlating the new test scores with, for example, the scores that the same people get on a standardized intelligence test, or with their scores on problem-solving ability tests, or with their performance on learning tests. So we can correlate their scores on this new test of intelligence with other tests that we know are, are measures of intelligence to see if there is an association. And if there is, it means that our test of intelligence uh, might also be valid for measuring that, that construct. We can use it to estimate reliability. Correlations can be used to determine the reliability of some measurement process. For example, we could administer our new IQ test on two different occasions to the same group of people and see what the correlation is. If the correlation is high, then the test is reliable. If it is low, then it is not. Remember, we're doing an intelligence test. Intelligence is something that's supposed to remain relatively stable. You can learn more, but intelligence is supposed to be a little more inherent. So if somebody takes a test at time A, and then they take the test later at time B, it should be the same. They should not have wildly varying scores from the original one. We can use correlation for the theory verification. Many theories make specific predictions about the relationships between variables. For example, it's predicted that parents' and children's intelligences are positively related. If you have an intelligent parent, you have an intelligent child. If you have a less than intelligent parent, you're likely to have a less than intelligent child. And we can test this prediction by administering IQ tests to the parents and to their children and then measuring the correlation between the two scores. Now, of course, all of this uh, depends on you actually buying the, the um, assumption that IQ tests measure intelligence, which we could have a whole discussion about, by the way. But we're just talking about the statistics here. So how do we get ready for correlation? For, for one thing, the Pearson correlation coefficient is a parametric test, and you already know what that is, and is subject to significance testing, and you know what that is. So what two things must we do to prepare for a correlation analysis? Well, we have to check for violations of the parametric test assumptions, and we have to prepare to go through the seven steps of hypothesis testing. That's where we will start by looking at this made-up problem uh, in the next screencast.